Good evening and welcome. I'm Luis Jaramillo, the director of the creative writing program here at the New School. Welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so last year I discovered that Kaveh Kahnem and the New School MFA program are the exact same age. So I guess we're both 21 now. Uh, we're legal. Uh, to, to, we can drink. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so I think the MFA program at the New School and Kaveh Kahnem were founded uh, with a, a similar idea, which was to support writers that weren't being heard, uh, and how do we do that? There are lots of ways to do that. Kaveh Kahnem has done that so fantastically. Now all the Kaveh Kahnem poets win all the awards, and at the New School we have over 40 graduates a year publishing books, so I think we've come a long way. I'm so thrilled to have our first reading, uh, our first uh, four readings of the year with Ka Kaveh Kahnem tonight. Um, I'm now going to pass it on to Elizabeth Bryant from Kaveh Kahnem. Please welcome to the lectern. Hello and welcome. My name is Elizabeth Bryant. I am the Programs and Communications Coordinator at Kaveh Kahnem. As you may know, Kaveh Kahnem is a home for the many voices of black poetry. We are a national organization dedicated to cultivating the artistic and professional growth of black poets. You can learn more about us, what we're up to, and ways to support by visiting our website, kavekanampoets.org. We have a really wonderful season of events coming up this fall. Next Saturday, October 8th, Kaveh Kahnem will be at the Brooklyn Museum as part of their first Saturday's event series. You can meet us at 8.30 p.m. in the Americas Galleries to hear Kaveh Kahnem Fellows Daryl Alejandro Holmes and Jessica Lene Moore read work that celebrates the transcendent artistry of Latinx and Hispanic peoples. Also, submissions are open for just a few more days for the Toy Derricotte and Cornelius Eady Chapbook Prize, which seeks to publish an outstanding manuscript by a black poet regardless of their publishing history. You should submit your manuscripts by September 30th at 11.59 p.m., but hopefully before that. Uh, to stay abreast of our goings on and of affiliated events, prize deadlines, and other news, you should follow us on Facebook, at Kaveh Kahnem Poets on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you to Greenlight Books. Tonight, their representative, Erica, will be selling books by our presenters. And on that table, you will also be able to sign up for our mailing list. Thank you also to the New School Creative Writing Program with special gratitude to Luis Jaramillo and Lori Lynn Turner. Um, we have a really wonderful partnership with you all, and I can't seem to make eye contact. Where are, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just so grateful to be working with you again for another year. Um, thank you to our funders, the New York State Council on the Arts, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the Whiting Foundation. Of course, special thanks to our beautiful audience members. Now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's poets. Of our first reader, Lucille Clifton once said, she sees with a brave eye and hears the music of all our languages validating each. Her story is the human story, her sharing it an act of great generosity. Ramika Bingham Risher, a native of Phoenix, Arizona, is a Cave Kahnem fellow and Afrilation poet. Among other journals, her work has been published in the Writer's Chronicle, New Letters, Callaloo, and Essence. She is the author of Conversation, winner of the Naomi Long Magic Poetry Award. What We Ask of Flesh, shortlisted for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and most recently, Starlight and Error, winner of the Diode Editions Book Award. She is the Director of Quality Enhancement Plan Initiatives at o Old Dominion University. She resides in Norfolk, Virginia, with her husband and children. 2017 Larry Neal Writers Award winner and this evening's moderator, Taylor Johnson, is a poet from Washington, D.C. They've received fellowships and scholarships from Callaloo Creative Writing Workshop, Cave Canem, Lambda Literary Foundation, Vona, the Vermont Studio Center, and Fine Arts Work Center. Their work appears in the Minnesota Review and Callaloo. They are currently working on their first collection of poems. 
Monica Yoon tells her students to think of poems as language plus, language with value added beyond its everyday use. She is the author of Black Acre, which was awarded the William Carl Carlos Williams Award of the Poetry Society of America and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Additionally, Black Acre was named one of the best poetry collections of the year by the New York Times, the Washington Post, and BuzzFeed. It is also available for sale, so you can um, verify all of those claims. <laughs> um, her previous book, Ignatz, was a finalist for the National Book Award. The daughter of Korean immigrant, immigrants and a former lawyer, Yoon teaches at Princeton University and in the MFA programs at Sarah Lawrence College and Columbia University. Please join me in welcoming to the mic, Ramika bingham Risher. So clearly they wanted to just start out by embarrassing me, just kidding. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out. Um, it was a gorgeous day. I don't know who made that happen in New York, but I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna start with a few poems um, from my second book, What We Ask of Flesh. Um, I write a whole lot uh, about biblical retellings, uh, family stories, women's histories, um, stories about uh, children, black folks, all kinds of things converge here. Um, but the book starts with um, a story about a woman in the book of Judges from the scriptures who, um, let's just get violent right off, who is <laughs> cut into 12 pieces by her husband after he finds her. She's been um, raped by a townsman. You know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, it's like that, but no angel intervenes on this woman's behalf, right? So it starts this big war. And um, when I was coming into my own womanhood, um, buying a house and you know just getting out of school, I started kind of dreaming about this woman after reading that account in um, the book of Judges. And so um, I wrote this poem in 12 parts. So this is the body speaks. I'll just read one or two sections. We become what we live. So this act becomes merely the story. Men become one large phallus towering into night. By rending garments and insides, hands become the fissure, torches by being the sole points of light, become stars. In the process of being broken, this sum becomes every broken body. By being flesh gone, only spirit, we are ever being here and always here. So the poem, like I said, is in 12 sections. Um, and some of them are in the voice of the woman and some of them are in the voice of like the body total, like the one you just heard. And a few of them are in uh, the present in the voice of the, the poet. Um, I woke up one night uh, while I was writing these poems and I had a large bruise that I didn't remember coming from anywhere. Um, and so, so many things, you know how this is. if some of you are poets in the room, so much of your everyday living just comes back in the work, right? Hey, you. The bruise I can't remember is like the dream of the woman's body, intact, whole. I imagine the red welt on my breast is the body's pleading, its landmark. The woman re-enters almost as much as the quickened heartbeat when I glance in the mirror. She is splintered, battered, dark, like me, like my body. She, too, returns to the house, wearied, amnesic, to lay what's left of her down. So the book goes on, um, 
There's several long, long poems, but eventually it all goes back to what's happening in your own space and time. Um, and this is a poem called Things I Carried Coming Into the World. The weight of my parents, the dawn of them. My grandmother's lackluster life, the guilt of my grandfather's mistress after he'd been scalded with hot water, tender flesh boiling on his back. My color, the umber slick of it, deepening over two weeks' time, an aunt worrisome, it would never stop the heart of a boy whose name was forgotten before it was given, who passed me a note in fourth grade that I spat upon and shot back in scribbled torn pieces. Obligation, the bane of memory, the cleft a loss in 1967 creates when a mother of mine, two mothers removed, is left broken on the sidewalk after a drunk white man jumps the curb in the colored neighborhood. The sorrow of the familiar voice that has to tell me this. My father's falsetto before nicotine had its way with his song, Jesus, and all his demands, soft hands, the sight of a woman at my first funeral, called away to God, erupted, brought back in a mega church. The bend of a slow, steady hump overpowering an uncle's back. My godson's vermilion face, the uncertainty of him. The walk I took with his mother past the clinic through the divide. A fistful of wanting. Foreign bodies wandering through my own. A blow to the insides when distance walks in. The braid of death streaked and ribboned against my family's back. It's greedy interruption, it's persistence, the unwanted strands of the thick laced thing. Um, and because all life is not sorrow, let's take a turn. Um, my husband likes to say that what we ask of flesh is my poet's book and Starlight and Error, the book that just came out, he uh, says that's his book, <laughs> right? So um, in short, Starlight and Error is um, about connections in many of the same ways, but there are threads that run through it. Lots of the song, uh, lots of the poems take songs from titles. Um, my parents' story, an aunt and uncle are traced, and then my husband and I, uh, he was my first little boyfriend in the seventh grade, and um, 15 years after we had lost track of each other, he found my poetry website, and nine months later, we got married. Okay. So, so it gets better, y'all. Um, so this is young, small, and growing, often violently. Um, I like to trace kind of our beginnings from the very beginning. Music can't save you, but it marks a place. And the knife can be a fierce negotiator. I learned this reckoning from the women raising me. My mother's four sisters, my father's three, grandmothers, play cousins, surrogate aunties. They crowd a table throwing cards and customs, warbling. I take a shining to everything they allow me to hear. The whiz and kingdom melodies, Motown, handle every haunt and opening. They tell me singing is my gift. Use it for rapture, not apology. And to cut any boy who messes with me. At weddings, funerals, school assemblies, my voice is their tender yield. Boys brave enough to try me always learn what I'm learning to be. A straight blade, a canticle bigger than their scattering curve and contour of mother's hands echo aurora an orchestra a galaxy so um this book doesn't just tell the story of all those lovers um 
it also tells the story of my children um, who I inherited from my husband. When we got married, they were 12 and four. They are now 12 and 19. Um, girl, I know. <laughs> and so um, I'll read a few of their poems. So um, when we got married, uh, I'm a poet and uh, we were newlyweds, so we were broke, of course. <laughs> um, and the kids kept begging us to have a baby. Isn't that the weirdest thing you've ever heard? Like, all the time. So much so that they eventually, like, to be funny, would set a plate for the unborn baby at the dinner table. I was like, y'all just like being broke. So anyway, um, I wrote this poem in response to that. It's called Beckoning. They name him Christian. They see him in others, in my arms. They wonder about his eyes and ears. They bargain. What about next year? What about when we're not so broke? They point out the silver lining. Love after love after love. They beg. They enlist my mother. That is an inaccuracy. They align themselves with my mother. They lose their patience, get indignant. They talk to him at the dinner table. They set a place. They count the years between them. Sometimes they are good and quiet as a trap. They leave off for a while, but always come back. They call the barren, the broken, the distant, well-worn. They are the living beckoning the unborn. Um, just a few more, maybe. Um, so what happens when you raise kids is the world, uh, or everything in it, seems to be under a magnifying glass. So of course, uh, when we got married um, seven years ago now, so much was going on, but one of the things that happened is Trayvon is killed, and my son is uh, not even 10 years old yet, and I am in a state of panic. Um, so irrationally, I start pulling all of the hoodies out of his closet, maybe in hopes of keeping him safe. Um, and what comes of that actual act is this poem, which is just kind of a long litany, um, which reminds me that Poetry can help us work through those difficult times, too. Our child is not yet 10, and we are clearing his closet of do-rags, backpacks, hoodoo, who rides, black magic, mysterious gadgets, misters and misses, the missing, heretics, hearsay, heard him tell, run and tell it, snitches, stitches, sticks, savings, saviors, toms, dicks, nightsticks, shanks, broken bottles, blunts, objects, bullets, ballistics, crypt walks, autopsies, undergrounds, jaywalking, gestures, gentrification, justifications, juries, kickbacks, nickel bags, accessories, never seen, dragging, drug cartels, trafficking, riding while, driving while, looking while, loud talking, Mirandas, bandanas, the asphalt line, blood in the streets, bloods in these streets, gang banging, bass slamming, mama, we was just out listening to at the wrong place, wrong time tongue-tying, articulation, relations, bad associations, watch who you know, love, bump into, fist bumping, fist fighting, forced arrest, urban unrest, what it looks like, who coins it, who sets up camp, who's pictured on those shorts, why children are in these streets, what blisters and boys, boy, tie up those laces, unzip that hood. Um, and I'll end with some poems for my husband, because he makes all of that good anyway. 
Um, yeah, just a little poem. Because Lamar Wilson told me I have to sing every time I read from this book. Um, so like I said, a lot of the poems have song titles. Um, this is Baby Be Mine, which you should all know from Michael Jackson. You know that song, right? So there's lines from that song in it, but um, it really makes um, me laugh because one night early in our marriage, um, my husband was still asleep, but the song was playing in the room, and he was singing in his sleep. <laughs> Baby be mine. The song is honey mint on his tongue. In his sleep, he answers questions. There'll be no more mountains and gives commands. Make sweet love this way. Blind root worker making turnstiles of us as I wake. He spins into my hollows, half dreaming. And when good sense plagues me, fear of what could be, he is still beside me, singing. As long as we believe. Hmm. One last poem, little one. Um, so um, an exercise I give my students is to write the last poem that you would write if the world is ending. Um, and right before this book came out, they turned the tables on me and made me write it. So this is what I wrote. If this world is ending, and it's to my husband, and it's the poem all men want to hear, I think. All I've been meaning to say is, I was wrong. <laughs> when we were children, and you knew to love me like we'd end up in each other's arms. And I was the foolish one who thought God couldn't make anything possible and wouldn't move space and time to bring us into being. Without me, you might not have wasted those years on doubt. Without me, you may have been granted every gladness in between. But here we are now, root and bud and grafting, me, with my regrets and you with your believing. Great deity of all mending, surest light I've ever known. Thank you. I'm so, so happy to be here. I mean, it's you know, always wonderful to be at the new school, and I'm especially just happy and gratified to and honored to be here uh, uh, with Cave Canem, which is an organization which I have followed and supported for years now, and I'm just, I'm thrilled. And I'm especially thrilled to be uh, reading with Remika, who I didn't want, I didn't want to uh, start reading because that would mean that she had to stop reading. When I was <laughs> enjoying it so much. Um, so I, um, you know, sort of going off of what uh, she just did, but in a, unfortunately in a darker tone, um, this is a, uh, also a poem that has to do with a tree. Um, this is a poem I wrote to my mother, um, and it's kind of a plan B sort of a poem. My mother, um, her husband, uh, my father had left after 45 years of marriage. She was about 70, and uh, and she was freaking out. She, uh, Her marriage was the central fact of her life, and she was talking about killing herself. She didn't know how to go on, and so this was some version of what I told her. Um, Hangman's Tree, Yggdrasil. To see a living thing, a badly damaged thing, and to fail to understand how life still catches hold of it and clings without falling through, like water falling through a bowl more fisher than bowl. Just as a bowl must be waterproof, a body must be life-proof, we assume as if a life were bound by laws of gravity, always seeking a downward escape. But then there is this olive tree, if tree is still the word to describe this improbable arrangement of bark and twig and leaf, this tree ripped in three pieces down to the ground, 
no longer a column, instead a triple helix of spiraling bark verticals, sketching the outline where the tree used to be. No heartwood. Very little wood left at all, the exposed surfaces green with moss, dandelions filling the foot-wide gap at its base. And still, the tree thrives, taking its place in the formal alley that edges this gravel road, sending out leafy shoots and unripe olives in the prescribed shapes and quantities, lizard haven, beetle home. I was wrong when I told you life starts at the center and radiates outward. There is another mode of life, one that draws sustenance from the peripheries. Each slim leaf slots itself into the green air. Each capillary root sutures itself into the soil. Together, these small adhesions can bear the much diminished weight of the whole. I won't lie. It will hurt. It will force you to depend on those contingent things you have always professed to despise. But it will suffice. It will keep you alive. Um, so most of the book is uh, based on this word blackacre. You know, I used to be a lawyer. First I was a private practice lawyer, then I was an ele a public interest election lawyer. And uh, blackacre is a word that every lawyer learns in law school. It's kind of like as John Doe is to a person, uh, blackacre is to a piece of property. It's a name for a hypothetical placeholder, right? Uh, and so a lot of law school's exams are like, uh, you know, John Doe bequeaths his property to blackacre uh, to Jane Roe in exchange for her property, whiteacre. And so there's this whole sequence to the hypothetical. Um, and so. I thought about that, I think, largely with respect to my own experience of infertility. Um, but I wrote, I did write a sequence of these, um, of these acre poems of, you know, black acre, white acre, red acre, blue acre, green acre. Um, so this first one is called Green Acre. Um, it is based on the back of the $1 bill. It's kind of an ekphrastic. And you know you know how the $1 bill is kind of all filled with like little filigree and curlicues and like, you know, if you look closely under a magnifying glass. Um, actually, no, I, actually, I, I'm looking at that. I don't want to read that. I want to start with this one. Um, this is, um, this one's called White Acre, and um, this one was actually written for a bet. Uh, we did have a baby. Uh, we um, we had a baby, uh, you know, with an egg donor, and um, and when the baby was just born, he was born uh, December 2014. And a colleague uh, said, okay, those of us who are new parents, let's all try to write a, a poem during our baby's nap time. So I did. And during the baby's nap time, we had the little, you know, white noise app on. And white noise, um, you know, is the same sound wave replicated over and over again. It's just the same sound. And um, at the time, we lived very close to Foley Square, and what the sound was drowning out was the sound of the Black Lives Matter protests, um, which were happening below us, the sound of the helicopters, sound of the sirens. Um, so I wrote this. Uh, no, I was, and I was interested in how early people are taught to surround themselves with sameness as a source of comfort. White Acre. You pro oh, and the, the epigraph is from the White Noise app. Um, you probably have noticed if you're in a brightly lit room filled with white light, it is difficult to see colored lights. That's because those individual colors get masked by surrounding white light. In the same way, other sounds will get masked by white noise so they become less detectable. Proleptic flinch of whiteness. The hunch of shouldering into it, stoic glitch zipping up its jacket of static knit fabric of interlocking Zs. The apotropaic as abject, self-replicating reflex of self-defense, vain camouflage that functions as neither shield nor shelter, the canker's milk nourishes nothing, the ice rink exudes only its own doom. 
Uh, this is called Goldacre. It's um, <clears throat> it's sort of based on this urban legend that went around my junior high school, which is that Twinkies, the the baked good, aren't actually baked. They're kind of this goo that's like extruded in a lab onto a tray and then is exposed to a chemical catalyst. So it sort of foams up and it grows this kind of golden outer layer on top of this inner gooey layer. Um, and this is this was what we were told. This is what we believed. And um, I later found out that this was not, in fact, true. I was very disappointed. Um, I guess the other thing that I wanted to mention is that the poem is written in the subjunctive. Everything starts with an as if. And in English, uh, the subjunctive often seems like is uh, indistinguishable in its construction from the past tense. So you are becomes as if you were, right? And the subjunctive is the mode in which we use to talk about unreality or fantasy. And I was thinking, well, what is it that makes us or how we are taught to, um, to cloak our fantasies in the language of history, right? Uh, particularly with reference to tradition. And you can see this happening again and again. You see it with Arianism. You see it with Gone with the Wind. You see it with Make America Great Again. What is that value added by that again in that statement? Um, so, Goldacre. As if you were ever wide-eyed enough to believe in urban legends. As if these plot elements weren't the stalest of cliches, the secret lab, the anaerobic chamber, the gloved hand ex machina, the chemical-infused fog. As if every origin story didn't center on the same sweet myth of a lost wholeness. As if such longing would seem more palatable if packaged as nostalgia as if there had once been a moment of unity, smoothly numinous, pellucid, as if inner and outer were merely phases of the same substance, as if this whiteness had been your original condition, as if it hadn't been what was piped into you, what seeped into each vacant cell, each air hole, each pore, as if you had started out skinless, shameless, blameless, creamy as if whipped, passive as if extruded, quivering with volatility in a metal mold, as if a catalyzing vapor triggered a latent reaction, as if your flesh foamed up a hydrogenated emulsion consisting mostly of trapped air, as if, though sponge-like, you could remain shelf-stable for decades, part embalming fluid, part rocket fuel, part glue, as if you had been named twin, a word for likeness, or wink, a word for joke, or ink, a word for stain, or key, a word for answer. As if your skin oxidized to its present burnished hue, golden, as if homemade. Um, so as I said, a lot of the book is about infertility, and you know, uh, you know, when I was diagnosed as infertile, you know, I, you know, my uh, husband and I went through just years and years of subjecting ourselves to every possible treatment, give up this, give up that, stick needles here, stick needles there, give blood, like, you know, do all of these things in this sort of desperate rush. And I think what struck me, strikes me about it looking back on it is not that, you know, yes, it was disappointing, you know, yes, it you know, it was a medical issue. But what I remember the most is the sense of shame I felt about it. And, you know, women come up to me now after readings and they say like, I had a miscarriage or like, you know, I can't, I can't have children, we tried and I can't. And they, they whisper uh, in a way that they wouldn't whisper if they had diabetes or if, you know, they had some other medical condition, they whisper because they have been made to feel personally ashamed. Uh, they have been made to feel devalued as if their value is womanhood and here's in their fertility. And, you know, and I was thinking about that and being like, where does that all start? Where does that all come from? Um, and uh, part of it is in the stories that we tell our little girls. And, uh, you know, I was thinking of 
Peter Pan in particular, and I remembered there was this weird story in Peter Pan, the original book, uh, which is a very beautiful, very strange, and a very sinister book. Um, so the you know the Lost Boys desperately want this little girl Wendy to come to Neverland uh, to stay with them and to be their mother. And at one point, it's said that they build a little house for her uh, to convince her to stay. And Everything, you know, all they have to build with are these red vines uh, that are lying around that are oozing this red sticky sap. So they have this red, oozy, veiny looking sticky house that they build for her. And I was like, wow, you know, subtle. Um, so what could that be? Uh, um, and um, so anyways, the epigraph here is from, uh, from Peter and Wendy, Red Acre. Of course, Slightly was the first to get his word in. Wendy, lady, he said rapidly, for you we built this house. Oh, say you're pleased, cried Nibs. Lovely, darling house, Wendy said, and there were the very words they had hoped she would say. And we are your children, cried the twins. Then all went on their knees and holding out their arms cried, Oh, Wendy, lady, be our mother. Ought I, Wendy said, all shining. Of course, it's frightfully fascinating, but you see, I am only a little girl. I have no real experience. Redacre. In a scheme to entice her, they fashioned a shrine with jewel work of berries, with cruel work of vines. Red mullions flaunting flocked velvet drapes, rose-patterned carpets in plush-piled heaps. At the pulsating heart of this upholstered nest, a snug seat like a socket that whispered of rest. But I can't be your mother. I'm not ready yet. And the eaves of the little home slumped with regret. And its sorrow turned inward, turned acid, turned foul. And corrosion traced stencils in slime on the wall. And the draperies puddled in ponds on the floor. And the overripe cushions ruptured like sores. The seat melted to nothing. A hollowed out void drained away everything in a purgative flood. More taboo than urine, an effluvial flow streamed toward the sewers, a liquefied no. Wide-eyed and wide-mouthed, she gaped in dismay, as pearl-like the possibles went floating away. And then the last poem I will read is, uh, is an ekphrastic that is uh, based on a sonogram of what seems to have been my last viable egg. Blackacre. One day they showed me a dark moon ringed with a bright nimbus on a swirling gray screen. They called it my last chance for never-ending life. But the next day it was gone. It had already launched itself into the gray sky like an escape capsule, accidentally empty, sent spiraling into the unpeopled galaxies of my trackless gray body. Um, and I was going to read one more, if you'll bear with me, if my iPad has enough juice. Um, so, uh, and uh, let me just find it. I'm sorry. I'm not my most organized day. Actually, I think I don't have enough juice on that, so I'll just end there, and I think we're at time. But thank you. Thank you both so much. We have a hand for the readers. That was amazing. Um, Really beautiful. So I wanted to start off um, with something, and I hope that you know most of the discussion can go this way, just kind of weaving in threads that I see throughout both of your work. Um, yeah. So something I notice in your work, Monica, um, think of your use of Milton in your latest text, Black Acre, and then, you know, the ekphrastic poems in that text, and then also your use of Ignax in, in their previous book. Um, and then, Ramika, I'm thinking of your use of musical lyrics, uh, New Edition, Drake, uh, all the other song lyrics that permeate uh, Starlight and Air. And I'm wondering how you write through other voices and what kind of uh, methods do you use to build a palimpsest in your poems? Um, 
I mean, I don't really think of it as writing other voices because I think one thing that I started to understand in writing this book and maybe in writing my other books is that um, a lot of the things that I write about are things, stories like the Peter Pan thing or the Milton poem that I've had with me since I was, you know, for decades. Um, so that like when I do have an experience, I understand that experience through the stories and songs and patterns that I already know. Like I feel like it's not like I have an experience and then I compare it to a piece of art. Like I feel like I, you know, live through the stories that I already know and the stories that I was taught and, uh, you know, for better or for worse. And I feel like a lot of us do that. We feel, you know, we, you know, sort our experience into familiar patterns. Um, and so, I was, you know, I try to sort of bring that to light or make it explicit a little bit. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think my experience is maybe the same. Writing. The question about writing through other voices, though, that's interesting. I mean, I, I often find um, a spark sometimes after having lived an experience, you know, the next time you hear that song, then you hear it differently, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, like, for instance, there's a poem in the book that has um, a, a line. It takes its turn from a four-top song, Standing in the Shadows of Love, right? Everybody knows the song's fun, love song. Um, but when I heard it, um, after all of the craziness was going on with Black Lives Matter and, um, you know, all of these children losing their lives and these mothers having to take care of these children, I heard the song as a mother, like, pleading with her child not to go, which was weird because that's certainly not the intention of the song, but it opens up a different part of experience for you, and so the art becomes a different lens through which you can see. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Something that I've been thinking about recently is um, this one line from, I don't know if y'all know the, the book Poetics of Space by Bachelard. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this one line uh, that says, the being here is maintained by a being elsewhere, being from elsewhere. Um, and something that I see in both of your work is the function of memory and place happening a lot. And I'm wondering uh, just how you approach writing about memories. Um, from the perspective of the present, you know, and moving through time that way in your poems. And I see, I see it especially in your work, Ramika, and, and I was writing about your family and your parents, and yeah. I mean, I, I try to use honesty um, about the past as like my one, you know, crutch, <laughs> because um, I tell the story all the time. My first book, I have a poem called Fish Fry, but it used to be called the reason I wasn't invited to the last fish fry, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which means as a poet, when you start putting people's business in the streets, yeah. namely your aunts and your grandmothers and your parents, and sometimes they like, don't start talking around, <laughs> um, right? But I think that changes too, like people's relationship to how um, you capture memory changes, mm -hmm. because now they say things like, Ramika, come in here, because they're telling this story, and somebody got to write it down, right? Like, so you, their relationship um, has changed. But for me, um, it's about just uh, telling it like it is, why I change names to protect the guilty. But that <laughs> includes um, laying your own stuff bare, too. Mm -hmm. you know? So for me, um, memory becomes a place where I can kind of reclaim why I'm standing where I'm standing in the present. Yeah, and you know, for me, I write, you know, I write about memory, and um, I always feel a little like I was standing outside my memories. Like, I grew up in Houston, Texas, you know, uh, going to some really crappy schools, and uh, um, and just, you know, in Houston, like, you know, I go back to Houston, and I'm like a couple blocks from where I grew up, and people are like, you're not from around here, are you? You know, and I'm like, oh, well, yes, actually, I am, actually, you know, like, um, and uh, it's odd always, you know, and I had that all growing up. I was always the only Asian kid in my class, and so I was just this kind of like space alien. Like I was just like, you are not a part of the South. Like the Fellowship of Southern Writers is not gonna come knocking on my door anytime soon. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you are not part of our history. You are in this odd kind of observer role. So I always felt a little like an anthropologist. So even like the most directly, memory-based poems I write, I find myself taking like a, a side, you know, I'm not the hero of my own stories. Uh, I'm always watching. Yeah. 
Thank you. So something I was thinking about um, when you read the last poem for your son, Ramika, was the, the question that a lot of poets get during this time is like, what are you writing about now and how is it, um, how has your focus changed or has your focus changed given what's happening around us these days? And I know it's a, a dense and loaded question. It's so huge. I will say yeah. this, um, and I'm glad, I'm glad you gave me a chance to say it out loud. Um, I will say this, even while I was writing that book, I'm very invested um, in praise being political as well, mm -hmm. right? Like, because I think we get so bogged down in the difficulty of living that we forget that living is its own kind of gift. Um, and so I was really invested while I was writing um, Starlight and Air in the balance. And maybe that's just because I was coming off of a very heavy book, mm -hmm. right? Like really dense and dealing with very difficult issues. Um, so even though the world is continuously a difficult um, place, I was very interested in making sure that there were these spites of brightness that were like my actual living. Like what's happening on the news, thank God, every day is not my actual living all the time. Um, we can't always escape it. I was just having a conversation with um, my uh, brilliant little cousin over there about um, microaggressions. And so, like, this is our everyday living, right? Like, we got to learn how to maneuver around that. But also my everyday living is my kid yelling, Mom, up the stairs and, like, you know, dabbing when I come to the door. Like, he don't have nothing to say. He just, yeah. you know, doing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that is also my everyday living, which is a joy, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I, I was very invested in that. Right now, what I'm writing about is really dense ethno ethnographic kind of research uh -huh. about my grandmothers, mm -hmm. this kind of convergence that happens with both sides of my family. And I think, going back to like what um, Monica was saying, um, I think kind of retracing memory and how like we got here and how we survived through so many different things um, gives me all the kind of strength that I need to endure what's happening in everyday living. So the way that I write about what's happening now is to go back and look at how we're still surviving. Yeah, and I think, you know, like a lot of people, I think, you know, I was, you know, uh, after the election, I found it hard to write. And for one thing, you know, in, in a way that was kind of good, like you sort of felt forced into community. I, I'm like, I feel, outraged along with everyone else who's outraged. I feel angry like along with everyone else who's angry. I feel like I am, you know, reinvestigating my privilege uh, in, in common with everyone who is reinvestigating their privilege. And, you know, and I feel like, you know, I'm in lockstep in a lot of ways. Uh, it's not the way in which I'm used to approaching art. Um, and, uh, and, but, you know, I think, well, you know, if Trump prevents us from writing individualistic, strange, like, hard to understand art, then he's already won. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I, I also have been kind of, I, I think the impulse to go back to family is very interesting because I've been, in, I've been interviewing, for example, my parents about their, their, um, their refugee experiences uh, during the Korean War. Uh, I've been, you know, trying to, you know, and part of that is I have a, you know, I was, ra my parents immigrated prior to the uh, Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965, so they came over very early when there were very few Asians in the country, and, um, and so they assimilated almost totally. They didn't teach me how to speak Korean. My brother didn't know how to use chopsticks until college. Um, and, uh, you know, and so I feel really deracinated, and I'm interested in writing about that, but at the same time, my son is half Korean, uh, even though he's not genetically mine, and I feel like I need to pass down a heritage that I don't actually have, like that I'm not in a position of, you know, in a relationship of authenticity to. So, um, so you know, that that is something I've been thinking a lot about, how important it is that that heritage not get lost. Yeah. There's a theme in your second book, and you know, throughout Starlight Air as well, and Monica also in Black Acre, this intimacy with the body um, and the speaker's body. And I'm always curious as to how poets write about the body. Um, from the movie, this is what it's this is what it's I'm wondering how you guys answer poems about the body. That's a good question. Um, you know, in, the, in what we ask of flesh, it's interesting because those poems, 
still, even the poems that are like in my voice and are personal, don't feel personal. I am absolutely mm -hmm. writing from the outside of personal experience. And so much of those poems, like the poems that I read about um, the um, poems from the Book of Judges, uh, and then there's other poems, uh, What We Ask of Flesh, the title poem is actually um, not about me either, but about um, a little girl who eventually gets burned and then uh, eventually kind of overcomes that experience. And there's all these different things, right, like wrestling with. Um, and so for me, the body just became a metaphor for the difficulty that all of us endure, right? And how the, that difficulty is nuanced and how there um, are so many ways to approach it, but how um, the only thing that we continue to ask of flesh is that we survive, that we keep going, that we keep moving. And I found it fascinating that we're able to continue doing that even in the most difficult circumstances. And so the body became my way to trace some of that. Yeah, I think, you know, for me too, that idea of survivorship and continuity and the weird drive toward life. Um, you know, my second book, the book before this one, had been uh, mostly about desire, and I don't feel like I felt this sort of oppositional, I didn't, f I didn't feel distanced from my own body in that book, I mean. Uh, and in this book, I really did, and part of that was just this, you know, this experience of, you know, like a doctor said, you know, like my doctor said to me, you're basically dead inside. You know, and I'm like, oh, thanks. Uh, you know, you're basically a 70-year-old written uh, wrapped in a, you know, in a 30-something-year-old's body. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> um, interesting to process that. That'll really help my sex life a lot. Thanks, Doc. Um, but you know, um, so uh, you know, and so that relationship of okay, what is this thing, the body, and um, what's happened to it, and how does my consciousness inhabit it became much more complicated, I yeah. think, in this book. Uh, um, so, uh, and also, you know, seeing what was happening to other people's bodies. Uh, you know, my yeah. mother and uh, my, we had a lot of kind of family tragedies around this time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, watching people. Uh, yeah, being their pick, own Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how we're just so beholden to, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we're beholden to our bodies because it's all we got. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're beholden to our bodies and, and like the wrestling that happens when something attacks our body or yeah, something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the opposite, too. Like, you know, how beholden we are to our bodies in desire. Like mm -hmm. we are just wrapped yeah. with that. Right. Like you can't escape it mm -hmm. when it's something that, you know, y you're called to. So I think that's just really interesting. When yeah. It comes back. Mm -hmm. I'm finding joy in uh, in all kinds of things. Uh, you know, I have a I have now a little boy who's almost three. Uh, you know, uh, I haven't seen him in three days. I just got a text uh, from our babysitter saying he says, uh, "I want mommy because I love mommy," <laughs> which I'm like, oh. Uh, so you know, I th that can't help but make you happy. Uh, and uh, um, and I'm taking a lot of pleasure in this moment of poetry. I was lucky enough to get to judge the uh, National Book Awards this summer, and so I was reading just you know crates and crates of books. I was reading like what was out there, and I was just like, this is this is great. You know, this is awesome. People are writing at such a high level, and there's so much going on, and so many so many little move. You know, just being able to take that sort of panoramic view was uh, was really a treat, and also lots of free books. So. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think, um, I mean, my faith is always something that keeps me really grounded, contented, like having a real, a, like deep inner sense, like of understanding and not being, um, you know, just irrationally angry all the time, right? Um, that, that keeps me centered. So that's always a source of happiness. Um, art too i mean there's just so much good art period like walking into this building and seeing the kara walkers mm -hmm. like i, I kind of lost it for a second because I, I live in norfolk virginia which is 
you know, down by the beach, and I hadn't actually seen a Kara Walker. So I was like, pull out the phone. Like, let's examine this. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, so I was just so excited to be able to witness, like, really contemplative, detailed, mm-hmm. interesting art. And I think that's happening everywhere. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's happening on Broadway. It's happening in, the, you know, I mean, it's happening in our schools. Like, my students are doing crazy work in the community. Like, I teach a community workshop. So art is always the thing that, you know, continues to bring me joy. Mm-hmm. It's just such an inspiration. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that same, it's, it's a different um, lens, but writing particularly about um, visual art, photographs, I've always been really taken with that art form. Um, so it shows up a lot in my work. Like sometimes if you get stuck, here's your, I don't know how many poets, we got poets in the room, like people who are writers, hey, hey, hey. So here's what you, here's something that I have my students do and something that I do. Like you ever been to like National Geographic's website and just looked at like the year's best photos or they have like just hundreds of photos of like crazy things from um, landscapes to like people to like newsworthy stuff. Um, And sometimes I'll just go through those slides until I find something or I'll write one line Mm -hmm. per photograph and see how that works together because I just think there's something about what happens when your subconscious is kind of stimulated in a way that you didn't imagine um so I just think right um art is just kind of one of the best ways to kind of have something thrown at you that you didn't expect and then thinking about um a poet that I really love Natasha Trethewey who talks a lot about Roland Barthes and the punctum in the photo right Um, And she writes a lot of ekrastic work, and she was one of my teachers. And that always comes back to me, like, what is the one thing that sticks out to you? Um, And that's a way that I kind of continue to approach ekrastic um, uh, work. Mm -hmm. And for me, like, writing an ekrastic poem is like having a dialogue rather than a monologue. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, well, how am I going to learn more about myself if I conduct a monologue or if I have a conversation Mm -hmm. and here's a conversation with something kind of great and let's talk to it and see what happens you know Um, and I always I always find that I really surprise I'm surprised by what you know I I feel like ekphrastics surprise you in ways that uh, don't surprise you when you're just you know hitting the ball against you know to yourself right Um, make them by looking closely at them and uh, by transforming them in certain ways, uh, by thinking about how, uh, you know, I often will, uh, you know, I'll start with a word, I'll start with a poem, um, and I'll dive into the etymology, to the sound, to the associations, and just keep going deeper and deeper into a word, and then, like, you know, it's like looking at something under a microscope. Like, if you look closely enough, you'll find out something new, even Mm -hmm. something that you thought you knew really well. and you'll keep going. I mean, the, that, uh, the Milton poem was one that like a teacher had me memorize when I was 15, mm-hmm. and like I thought I knew it. Uh, you know, I've known it by heart since, you know, for 30 years. I, and, um, like I thought, there's nothing new I can learn about. I've lectured on it. I've, you know, I'm like, there's nothing new you can tell me about this poem. And I spend like a month looking at it 
and just these worlds open up, like, you know, so. I think, um, you know, there's kind of a looking at what you think you know and then thinking about, like, just the denotative, of just whatever the dictionary says about it and then what are all the connotations that come with, like, mm -hmm. just hearing that term. But then um, to go back to kind of the second part of your question, Taylor, um, for me and translating experience, um, I think translating other people's experience sometimes comes through your own living, right? Like, so um, I tell people all the time, you know, our, our parents are always flawed until we become parents. And then you're like, oh, snap. <laughs> this is not easy. Yeah. Um, and, and so um, I really felt like, even though I'd lived with my parents' stories, obviously, and I, my parents who were divorced when I was 12 and then remarried again when I was 20, they just all mixed up crazy kids. Um, and my aunt and uncle's story, um, I had lived with those, but it was very different once I had the actual lived experience of like walking in their shoes, of having to be an adult and be in a relationship and deal with kids and the world and craziness. And I just, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I saw them as like actual whole human beings mm -hmm. and not just like, you know, the pinnacle that your parents are before you realize, oh, they're just adults trying to figure it out. Figure it out. They're just, yeah. you're new at this and they're gonna mess up. Um, and, and you can't uh, necessarily blame them for every single little thing. Um, and so translating part of that just came from, um, you know, my own experiences with some of the same issues. So something that I've been struggling a lot with in my work as a minority is the idea of forgiveness and how to allow myself to forgive the things that have happened to me in my life, but at the same time make sure that I don't downplay the significance in it. And it sounds like to me from both of your works it's something that you have encountered as well. Maybe you have some tips. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think part of that for me goes back to what I said about just telling the whole truth. Um, because I think, I mean, that's, that's what we're doing. Like, we're just reckoning with the truth as it is and how it helped remake us, right? Um, so I think part of that is the way that I deal with it. I just tell the story and then when they get mad, I just say, well, did I lie? And that's it, right? Um, <laughs> and so really, like, that helps. Um, and so, um, not only that, but I think, you know, writing for me very seriously, um, it's not therapy, therapy is therapy, so do that too, um, because that's helpful. But writing for me really helps me figure out how I might still be feeling about that thing, no matter how distant it is. Like Taylor brought up, there's a poem in here about New Edition, and I mean, I for sure I know I love New Edition, but the poem is wrestling with like how I felt when I was five and I saw my parents fight for the first time. So once I'm able to write through that full experience, like to the end, and then wrestle with it craft-wise, some of it is like, it, it just floats away. I'm freed of some of that. So I tell, you know, my folks all the time, like, don't worry about the poems that show up in the book. You worry about what never shows up in the book, <laughs> right? Because that means I'm not over that. Um, so, you know, really, I think writing really, really, really can help work your way through some of that so that it, forgiveness is so much easier once you've wrestled your way through how you're still feeling about that. Monica, what about you? Yeah, it's very similar for me. Like, I just, I feel like, you know, like an oyster gets like a sharp piece of grit in it, and the reflex is you have to get it out of yourself, and you have to coat it, and you have to make it into something that no longer bothers you, and here it is. And, you know, so if you had talked to me before I wrote this book about my infertility, I'd be like, oh, my infertility is is this self-hatred and self-doubt that I keep embedded somewhere in my body, you know? And, uh, you know, and now I'm like, no, 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 it's this book. Here it is. Like, you know, here it is. Uh, it's out and you know once it's out I can be like all right I can this is why people say that like you know artists are terrible at taking care of themselves because like any trauma just becomes like source material and if it doesn't kill you then you know you're just like oh good more art stuff yeah I know. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to try and say this in a way that makes sense. Um, so you both talked about writing from the perspectives of memory. Monica, you talked about the subjunctive, which I'm also fascinated with, um, about maybe writing that is prophecy or projection. And so I'm wondering if you've noticed patterns in your work where you fall into those voices or those modes of approaching the material in the poem and why you do that. And also I'm particularly interested in where you might, what voice you might choose to use for the purposes of healing or if there's any vari variation of voices or perspectives that you might use or you might have noticed using in your poems um, for that purpose. I mean, I'm not one of the poets to whom the concept of voice has been very helpful. I mean, for me, like, I like taking something and then getting an extreme angle on it and then getting an extreme angle on it and kind of triangulating my way to an understanding of it. Uh, and so, like, if I were to take a voice, like an authoritative take, then that wouldn't allow me to do that. So. Um, and so I find that there are a lot of different voices that allow me to um, unleash something. I tried writing this infertility poem in a lot of different ways. I was like, okay, maybe I'll try like a real plain speech sort of reportage sort of way, and like maybe I'll try like a uh, sort of girlesque, sort of crass and sassy thing, and maybe I'll try a, you know. Um, and eventually, you know, for the long Milton sequence in the book, what unlocked it for me was to say, okay, what do I have that, n you know, you know, what's left? And I was like, okay, well, one thing that's left is I have this like dry as dust lawyer voice that I do, uh, and let's just start with that and see what's happened. So let's start and let's list the things in the poem, you know, in this Milton sonnet, and start talking about the definite versus the indefinite article is going to be my entry into this poem. And that is weirdly enough what unlocked the poem for me, and I'm like, okay, now I can write it. This is, th I don't know why that worked where nothing else had worked, but uh, suddenly that, I think that, you know, it's very hard for me, I feel like to, take on the burden in, of writing always from your own voice is a very scary thing, and I respect people who do it. Uh, I feel like, I always feel like to have that sort of authority, like I'm more comfortable when I can role play a little bit, you know? I absolutely agree. I mean, I think for sure, voice isn't something that I'm concentrating on often. I think though, as I was thinking about the question, often the art that is inspiring the piece in some way might dictate voice. So just thinking about like when I was writing the what, uh, what We Ask of Flesh, the Body Speaks poems, I know the diction is a little bit different because I, I was reading scripture a lot. So I think I was going back to that often and like finding a way to inhabit what I imagine, you know, like from that voice. And, and what I imagine is missing because I'm always interested in like retellings but I just want to know like the story behind the story like behind that story so it's a different kind of triangle but for sure um, so I, I think whatever is inspiring the thing often dictates the voice if that makes sense hi um I have a question in, I guess, a similar vein um, about perspective. And you both write um, about mythology or other stories that you've encountered. And I'm wondering, when you decide to inhabit those stories, um, how are you pulled to either inhabit like a character as in like the I or the world around the character and how uh, or the speaker um, and how you kind of pu are pulled or how you navigate that or decide um, on the perspective of the poem. Um, it just depends on what the poem is but I mean like persona for me is just a really important like way for me to enter a space. So oftentimes, you know, I'll take that persona's perspective, but use I, right? Like, so trying to inhabit that persona's space. 
Um, but other times, I'm just trying to, like, uh, write as if I'm the photographer, as if I'm, like, on the outside looking in and just, or reporting back something. So it really just depends on um, what particular stance I'm taking. There is no, um, I think, other than, like, stuff that is inherently personal, like, you know, family poems that might dictate that I take a really like personal narrative but sometimes I have to break that a whole lot more so I find myself leaning toward an outside voice when I'm looking at something that I'm very close to in order to just create some distance for myself yeah I um, you know I think about the persona that I've used and I noticed that I uh, well in this book all of the times I use the first person for someone who's not me I'm some sort of monster like I'm someone awful I'm Saturn eating his children I am like you know I'm just I'm this hanged person like you know it's just you know I'm I'm it's I'm a nightmare in this book um, and you know in my previous book uh, I did the first person for the voice of crazy cat you know this kind of lovelorn cat uh, a lot and um, and I think both of those are sufficiently grotesque. You know, they're all at a sufficient distance from me that I can, you know, that I, c I think I can really take advantage of the freedom that that, you know, allows you and just be like, all right, I'm just going to say something damn weird here or I'm going to say something kind of evil now. Like, and, uh, you know, and you get permission to do that. Hi, Monica, I know you probably get this question a lot, but I'm just really interested in the connection between your your past as a lawyer and as a poet, what that transition looked like, and also if those things entangle in your poetry or whether they're, I mean, obviously they're not separate, but. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're coming closer and closer together for me as I have stopped, you know, I have, been practicing law for five years now. I wrote my first two books while I was a lawyer. Um, I would go to residencies and just uh, and just write at high speeds <laughs> until I had finished books. Uh, I think my second book, uh, which I wrote while I was entirely in private practice uh, and working between 60 and 80 hours a week, particularly like shows that because it's all in really short bits, you know, and I'm like, I just did not have a lot of time writing that book. And, you know, this book, I had quit the law and, it, you know, the poems got a lot longer and a lot fatter. <laughs> Who knew? Um, but like, I think that, um, you know, people like to put down poets and say, oh, you guys are just dealing with unreality and metaphor. And, you know, metaphor is is analogical reasoning, is what the law is. Um, I mean, if you think about, like, Citizens United was, you know, I, my last job was uh, largely uh, fighting against Citizens United. And if you think about Citizens United, what it is, it is three metaphors. It is that money is speech, that corporations are people, and that elections are a marketplace that should go to the highest bidder, right? And if you're able to displace those metaphors, if you say, no, an election should actually maybe be more like a courtroom where everyone gets an equal right to speak because the importance is placed on the jury making a good decision and having high quality information. Uh, and you can't pay some, but you can't pay the judge to get twice as much time in the courtroom. You know, um, It's just like ways of thinking about that relationship between truth and reality is something that poets do and something that lawyers do. I think that the two are very close. Um, also in their relationship toward language, like if you think about what equal protection of the law means, it does not mean what it meant in 1789, right? Uh, and it does not mean what all the words mean in the dictionary. It means every sum total of that word through history. And if you think about the way the poets, that poets use language like apple or, you know, uh, or darkness or, you know, the way in which these, these words just go through history accumulating meaning, that, that instability, uh, you know, it's very similar. I just want to say quickly, remind you that we have books um, from, from Greenlight. Um, also sign up for Kaveh Kanem's mailing list on that table. Enjoy snacks, ask questions of our wonderful poets. And thank you again. Yeah, come say hi. <laughs>